Once again, for the opportunity to worship in your house, Lord, I pray that you give us a good service. Lord, help the music and the preaching to bring honor and glory to you. And just, I ask that you bring a blessing upon all the proceedings here this evening. And I ask all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. What a joy to know the love that God has for each and every one of us. Let's stand and sing the song, The Love of God. 
the love of God. Let's sing about the love of God as greater for more than anything we can ever imagine. Let's sing that on that first verse.
Well, amen. Thank you for that, Patch Club. Let's stand. Let's sing one more song for this evening. Rock of Ages left for me. Let's stand. Let's sing that last song this evening. to worship you in song. Lord, this evening, I thank you for all that you've done. Lord, I pray that you bless this offering, use it to further your gospel here and around the world, and I ask all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated.
57. Uh, we'll make sure you get uh, out in the foyer there, pick up some tickets to be able to invite people out to our uh, concert this next week. Um, uh, the Blackwood Quartet will be singing in the morning service at 1030. And then they'll be doing a, a complete concert on Sunday evening service at 6 o'clock. And so make sure you get the word out there, invite people out, and it'll be a great opportunity uh, for them to hear the gospel and uh, great testimonies of what God can do in our life. I want to share a message entitled, Leaving the Past and Looking to the Future, in uh, Luke chapter 9, beginning in verse 57. When it came to pass, as they went in the way, a certain man said unto him, Lord, I will follow thee whithersoever thou goest. And Jesus said unto him, Foxes have holes, and birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man hath not where to lay his head. And he said unto another, Follow me. And he said, Lord, suffer me first to go and bury my father. And Jesus said unto him, Let the dead bury their dead. But uh, go uh, thou and preach the kingdom of God. And another also said, Lord, I will follow, follow thee, but let me first go bid them farewell, which are at my home, at my house. And Jesus said unto him, No man, having put his hand to the plow, and looking back, is fit for the kingdom of God. And that's pray. Father, thank you so much for allowing us to be together tonight to be able to study the word. We're, we certainly appreciate the songs we've been able to sing and uh, our Lord's special music with the Patch Club and choir. And uh, What a blessing it is, Lord, to be able to lift up the name of Jesus in song. And uh, what a blessing it is to be able to testify of your grace. We're thankful for uh, your blessings on this church uh, for these 83 years, uh, 43 years. And so, God, I pray that you might just continue to bless us and to help us understand uh, how we can just keep pressing forward. And uh, God will give you praise and glory for it all. Amen. I don't know why I want to keep saying that the church is older than what it is. I said it was 200 and some years old this morning. Now it's so, uh, you know. But I say 83. Did I say 83? I don't know. I'm losing it, folks. Uh, but anyway, uh, leaving the past and looking to the future. And uh, this is a great passage. We know it deals with Jesus talking to several individuals about following him and, uh, and uh, committing their ways to him. And they all make excuses about why they can't go right away. And, uh, and at the bottom, at the, verse 62 of our text, uh, the final conclusion that he says, no man having put his hand to the plow and looking back is fit for the kingdom of God. And I remember on the farm, we used to, when you get ready to plow a field and you're belaying that first furrow, uh, when you start, you'd uh, have to take and look down to the end of the field, find a tree or something that was fixed that was not moving, and then keep your eye on that. If you kept looking, every time you look back, you'd put a crank in the pat, in the furrow, in the plow. And so you, and Jesus is saying this, you can't look back constantly because when you look back, it's going to put a notch in, in your walk with him and your commitment to, to accomplish great things. And uh, nowadays, all these tractors have uh, GPSs in them, and the guys, they don't even know how to drive a tractor. And then they get in the tractor cab, they turn the radio on, they lay back and prop their feet up, they punch in the GPS, and it goes a nice straight line all the way to the end of the field. That's not farming to me. And, and, and farming is being out there at like John Deere where it's hot and it's uh, sweaty. The feet are getting hot because of the transmission getting hot, which are sitting on top of. And there's dust everywhere, flying all over, bugs biting you. And, and, and you're sweating like crazy. And you get to the end of the field and you say, man, that was a great plowing time. And that's farming, amen. But I got to leave the past behind. Yeah, right. I need to press towards the future. And uh, I, I read this quote and said, "Don't look back; something may be gaining on you." And uh, sometimes it, it just seems like some sometimes people just want to keep looking back all the time. And uh, the reality is, you can't change anything in the past. 
Uh, but you certainly can make some decisions for the future. And uh, so Jesus is dealing with this. No man having put his hand to the plow and looking back is not fit for the kingdom of heaven. The Bible presents the Christian life as a race. Mary Apostle Paul in uh, Hebrews chapter 12 and verse 1 and 2 deals with this matter of lay aside every weight and the sin that does so uh, well, easily beset us. And what are we supposed to do? We're supposed to run the race. And uh, in 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 24, uh, and through verse 27, Paul deals with this whole concept of being in the race to win. And so the Bible presents that we're in this great race that we ought to be looking forward rather than looking backwards all the time. And so you can you can uh, you can gain cannot gain what you lost. Uh, in the past, uh, you can change some commitments and resolves in your heart to press towards the mark of the prize of the high calling of God, uh, but you can't change anything in your past. In Ecclesiastes, I thought it was interesting how Ecclesiastes starts out in chapter 1 and the conclusion uh, that uh, Solomon comes to when he gets over to chapter 12 of Ecclesiastes. Ecclesiastes chapter 1 and verse 2, he starts out just saying, Vanity of vanity, saith the preacher, vanity of vanities, all is vanity. What profit hath the man of all his labor which is taken under the sun? Boy, you start to read a book like that, it's like, do I want to read any farther? Uh, it certainly isn't encouraging and challenging. You're telling me everything in my life, everything that's going on under the sun is just vanity, it's empty, it has no value, it has no worth. And then when you get at the end of the book, Ecclesiastes uh, chapter 12 and verse 13, he says, let us hear the conclusion of the whole matter. Fear God and keep his commandments, for this is the whole duty of man. And so it's hard to put things in perspective in chapter 1 when you understand everything is vanity. And then, but as you go through life and as you learn who God is and you live for Christ, you come to the end of your life realizing, wait a minute, the whole conclusion of the matter is very simple. You need to fear God and keep his commandments. And if we'll live that way and follow after Christ, uh, we will be able to see uh, some great experiences in our life uh, that will change those around us. It will change the world in which we live. Uh, but we have to leave the past and we have to look to the future. Uh, why? Because looking back uh, could depress you. I don't know what my life was without Christ is depressing. I don't want to think too much about what my life was without Christ. And, uh, but it may defeat you. Uh, the discouraging, mem discouraging memories, things that may haunt you, uh, can bring you to a point of emotionally defeated and you just kind of give up on life. And so we need to learn as Jesus is telling this fellow, uh, you can't, listen, you can't accomplish anything. Now you can't be fit for the kingdom of God if all you're going to do is just keep looking back. So you got to leave the past and you got to look to the future. I found that in ministry. And uh, I've seen a lot of guys just kind of fall by the wayside because all they do is talk about failures or they talk about discouraging times or talk about things and events that happen in their life in ministry and they get the idea, well, what's the sense in going on in ministry? Uh, hey, leave it alone. The past is the past. You can't change the past. I don't care how hard you try. You cannot change the past. And so we need to learn how to leave the past behind and be, learn how to look to the future. And so here's some thoughts. Got 22 points tonight. No, I don't have that many. That just makes you feel good when you find out it's only 10. But anyway, <laughs> it's not that many. Number one, here's a, here's a key thought that we need to remember. Don't look back at sins that you have been forgiven. Amen. And oftentimes people, I talk to people uh, over the years and they're like, well, you just don't know what my life was. I, I was such a sinful person. I can't do anything for God. Well, if God has forgiven you, won't you forgive yourself? Amen. If God has set you free from that, 
The reality is that every one of us has sinned. You just need to determine to be pure. And it's how are you going to deal with it right now? Are you going to just think about your sins in the past? Or are you going to determine to live in the future with a pure life? In John chapter 1, in uh, verse 8, uh, Jesus, uh, well, John said this. He said, if we say we have not sinned, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. The reality is every one of us here uh, in this room tonight has every one of us have sinned. So what are we going to do? Are we going to live in the past just remembering our sins of the past? Or are we going to determine to live in the future? We're going to determine to be pure in the future. And so that, that's a personal decision that you have to make. And, uh, and it, listen, it does you no good to constantly beat yourself up and remember the past and thinking that you can't do anything for God in the future. And so determine to be pure. I don't, ha listen, I don't have to live like I used to live. Before I got saved. Why? Because if any man is in Christ, he's a new creature. So I don't have to live that way. And it's, it's, it's alarming to me to see people get caught up who get saved. They're born again. They're living for God. And all of a sudden, all they do is start thinking about the past. And then the next thing you know, they're back into the old lifestyle again. Uh, watch out. Watch out. You need to forget your past and you need to determine to be pure in the future. And then I just see, think of this in reference to past sins. Uh, uh, confess, confession brings a cleansing. I need to remind myself of that. Uh, and so if, clen if confession brings a cleansing, then commitment enables sanctification in my life. John said, if any man say he is not sinned, uh, he deceives himself and he tells not the truth. But then he says, but if we confess our sins, Amen. Uh, he is faithful and just to forgive our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So the way that we deal with past sins is we acknowledge that God has forgiven us. And because I have confessed my sin before the Lord... Now I can be committed to God enabling me to experience the sanctification or the separating of God, uh, separating me to himself, separating me from my sin, separating me from the world that condemned me, and to be able to live my life based on the reality that all my sins have been forgiven and God has completely, completely cleansed me and if he has completely cleansed me, then he has absolutely gave me the ability to live a sanctified life. And so confession brings cleansing, which enables us to enjoy a sanctification. And then just remember this about uh, thinking back or looking back on sins. God removes our sin. Uh, not only is everyone a sinner and there's confession that brings cleansing, but remember this, ultimately, uh, the relationship we have with God is based on the fact that he removes our sin from us. So that means sin has no dominion over us. And so it, it's about really who are you going to surrender to? Are you going to surrender to memories of your sin in the past? Or are you going to surrender to the God of heaven who has removed your sin? And live in light of his dominion in your life rather than the dominion of sin in your life. And so you have to make that decision. I got to leave the past behind. And, uh, and I got to look to the future. And not only that, but number two, I see this. Don't, not only don't look back at sins, but don't look back at defeats that get you down. And there's all kinds of places where we fail in life. Uh, there's all kinds of, I, I know uh, my wife and I, we left Bible college. We went and started Gospel Lake Baptist Church. And I can tell you right now, my, my thought process was we were going to start Gospel Lake Baptist Church. We'll be there for the rest of our life. 
Within 10 years, the church will be running 1,500 people because I'll be preaching that good. <laughs> and the Lord told me something real fast because the first church service that we had, we had 35 people in attendance. The following Sunday, I did such a good job on the first Sunday that I preached. The next Sunday, it was my wife and I. That was it. The Sunday after that, an older lady that came to our first church service, she caught the bus, rode the bus up Route 35, got off on West Park Avenue, walked from Route 35 down to Ocean Township High School where we were meeting, and I had followed up on her, and the following Sunday was my wife, me, and her, Mrs. Valentino. I'll never forget her. And uh, she was what, in her 70s, I think, at that time? I guess. I baptized her, too. Yeah, I did. Yeah, amen. And uh, from that time on, I knew there would be at least three people in church. It would be my wife, me. I thought about to bring my dog once in a while. <laughs> Increase attendance. But, and Mrs. Valentino. We'd pick her up every Sunday to bring her to church. And uh, what, am I, what am I saying? Uh, after four years of being there, my wife and I both were burned out physically, emotionally, spiritually. We were exhausted. And, uh, and we left the church. And uh, I'm going to tell you, that was a, a major experience to go through that because it was a defeat. It was a defeat that was major in reference to my faith in reference to my abilities to do ministry. And I'm going to tell you, nobody came alongside of us and said, don't worry, God's not done with you. Nobody came alongside of us and started telling us how good things God would do for us uh, because he's not going to take his hand. Nobody said anything like that. Now listen, I can go and dwell on those experiences. And I'm telling you, there's a multitude of them in planting that first church that we planted. But why would I do that? I'm not going to look back on defeats because when I look back on defeats, it gets me down. It discourages me and it hurts me. And so acknowledge God's leadership in your life rather than looking back at past failures and defeats. Every one of us fail and are defeated in some way in our Christian life. And if you allow it to accumulate in your thought process, it will eat away at you to finally it will destroy your resolve to do something for God right now. In Psalm 37, in verse 23, tells us the steps of a good man are ordered by the Lord and he delighteth in his way. And so rather than me uh, looking to the past defeats and failures in my life, I want to live in the present, looking to the future, acknowledging God's leadership in my life. If I really believe that God is sovereign and God is in control of all things, and I really believe that God wants to use me, I'm not going to allow the defeats of the past to destroy me. I'm going to look to the God of heaven who wants to direct my steps at this very moment in time in my life. Amen. Why? Because I want to be able to overcome the defeats of the past and live in the victories of the future. And so acknowledge God's leadership. Act upon God's strength in your life. Psalm 37, 24 says, Though he fall, he shall not be utterly cast down, for the Lord upholdeth him with his hand. And I've found over the years, there's many times that, listen, I can stand up here for the next two hours and tell you things that I've failed at as a Christian and things I've failed at in the ministry. Uh, but the reality is each one of those failures caused me to stumble and fall. But wait a minute, there is a God in heaven who when you feel that you are cast down, there is a God in heaven who will hold you up. Amen. And I'm going to tell you, there's many places in your Christian life where there is nothing available to hold you up to move you to tomorrow other than the Lord Jesus Christ. And I'm thankful that I can look to him and act upon God's strength in my life. 
Why? I'm not going to look back at my defeats. I'm going to get a hold of God and look what he's going to do in the future. And then this, a matter of don't look at defeats, back at defeats, acquire confidence through life experiences. Uh, Psalm 37 in uh, verse 25 says, I have been young and now I'm old. And I said, Millie, the Bible becomes more real to me every day. <laughs> he says, yet I have not seen the righteous forsaken, nor is seed begging bread. Acquire confidence through life experiences. You may fail at things in your life, but remember this. When you walk with God, you watch God in a daily way provide for you and care for you and bless you and strengthen you and enable you to move forward. It's not about your strength. It's not about your abilities. It's about the God who is ever present with you. And I tell you, there are so many places in my Christian life where God has worked miracles to get me over the inabilities that I have. God has worked miracles in my life to be able to uh, help me not to condemn myself and get down on myself in reference to things that I have failed about because he shows me over and over again it's not about me and my failures. It about, is about him and his strength to bless me in the, next, in the future, in the next few days. And so I want to be able to press on. I want to be able to live my life for the glory of God. So I'm not going to look back at sins that I've been forgiven about. And I'm not going to look back at defeats that can get me down and destroy me. I'm going to look to God who can lift me up and help me move ahead. Number three, don't look back and see the past better than what it was. Uh, I tell you, I often think, oh, uh, boy, I tell you one thing, it was great driving tractor and trailer. <laughs> And then I stop and I think how many days I'd be on the road running that truck and uh, not being able to stop and shower because I wanted to press and get the next load. And then driving a truck, and, oh yeah, it was a lot of fun driving that truck, but no, I didn't tell you about the shifting boot on the floor was all rotted out and all the heat of the engine came up on my foot. I didn't tell you about that. I, I didn't tell you about, oh, that truck didn't have air conditioning. And uh, I didn't tell you about that. I didn't tell you about getting out on the road and, and you're out in the, I was out in Youngstown, Ohio, going to pick up a load to go to Dallas, Texas. And as I was going over, my transmission went out. I didn't tell you about that. But I told you how good it is driving that truck, man, shifting those gears and jaw ratching on that CV, man. It's, I'll tell you, it's a great, no, it wasn't great. I'm painting a picture in my mind that looks to the past like it was better than what the reality was of what it was, actually. I can tell you one thing. I sure do like preaching a whole lot better than driving truck. Yeah. All the times I told my wife, I said, man, well, I'll keep my CDL license maybe someday. If I ever retire, I'll go ahead and maybe drive truck for a little bit. And then <laughs> Mr. Powery was over here with his truck. He told me, Pastor, I got my truck over here. And he said, you want to take a drive? I said, sure, man. Let me get in there and jam some of those gears. And so I got in there and took a ride in that thing. And I was driving down the road. I was like, thank God I'm not driving truck. <laughs> <laughs> uh, is there anything wrong with driving? No, no, there isn't. But I'm going to tell you, it's a whole lot better living for Jesus and preaching the word of God. I can guarantee you that. So don't look back and see the past better than what it was. An inflated past will deceive you in the present. And so the devil likes to take, uh, take those types of things and, and stir us up and to defeat us. Uh, here's some quotes. I don't know if I put, did I put these quotes on there? I didn't put them on. Well, you have to listen then. Uh, I read this quote. Distance leads enhancement and I'm sorry enchantment I can't even read my own typing uh, distant lens enchantment and uh, in other words when you're thinking about things from way back in the past it has a tendency 
to paint a better picture than the reality of what it was. Nostalgia is never quite honest. You know, sometimes I get uh, I get thinking about uh, nostalgia. I start thinking about things that went on in my life, and, and I find myself having to stop and think. Well, wait a minute, wait. That's not exactly how it went. Watch out, nostalgia will trip you up. It'll make you think your life is better not in church. It'll make you think that your life is not better by being a Christian. It'll make you think that you can go back to the old lifestyle and that is going to be great and it's going to be blessed in your life. And the reality is uh, it's not being honest with you. Vance Havner said this, uh, the present is never as good as it used to be. Amen. You know, we, we say oftentimes, oh man, it used to be better than this. And, uh, you know, the reality is it wasn't better. You know, I, I like living today. I really do. And uh, so watch out. Don't look to the back, look back and see the past better than it was. Be honest with yourself. It wasn't that good. Living without Christ was not blessed. Living your life in the world was not rewarding. It, living your life for God is what brings you uh, rewards in heaven and in the present life. So an inflated past will deceive you in the present, but an a imitated past will completely defeat you. You know, the children of Israel, when they were brought out of Egypt, you do understand they were slaves for 430 years. You do understand that their amount of food that they had to eat was ration. Uh, you do understand that the Egyptians controlled every element of their lifestyle and every aspect of what they ate and how they relaxed or did not relax. Everything about their life was under the control of Egypt. And God, in 430 years of bondage, brought them out of bondage. And what's the first thing they're whining about? Oh, I wish we were back in Egypt eating the onions and the leeks. I don't know about you. I'd rather eat honey any day than onions and leeks. And uh, what was their problem? Uh, they, they are looking to the past as being better than what God is doing. God was feeding them with manna from heaven. Uh, they complained about not having meat. God had quails fly in and land so they could pick them up and eat meat. I'm, I'm just saying this. Our life is always better with Christ in the present looking to the future than it is to constantly be looking back and seeing the past uh, better than it really was. And so don't look back and uh, see the past better than it was. Number four. Don't look back at old conflicts that make you bitter. Oh my, how many people have been bitter? Uh, you look on the internet, sometimes you read these stories about people talking about ministries they've been involved in or Christians they've been connected with and, and they, the bitterness that flows out of their mouth. And I'm like, I, I read this stuff and I say, how can people live that way? I, I really couldn't live my life with a with a spirit of bitterness that just drives me and consumes me. Why? Because if you allow past conflicts to bring you bitterness in your heart, you will hinder the work of the Holy Spirit in you. Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 30 it says, And grieve not the Holy Spirit of God, whereby you are sealed unto the day of redemption. Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and evil speaking be put away from you, with all malice. Uh, what, what am I saying? If you want to be able to be successful in the future, you want to be able to live your life happy and, and joyful in Christ, uh, don't allow conflicts of the past to create bitterness in you. I, I have learned that situations where there's been a wrong done to me. It is better for me to go to the person who has wronged me and say, I forgive you, than it is for me to harbor resentment and bitterness in my life. And I'm going to tell you, bitterness will, will hinder the work of the Holy Spirit in you to the point where you will be completely destroyed 
and uh, uh, taken over with that spirit of bitterness. Uh, let her be there. You will infect wounds that will destroy you. 2 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 16. But shun profane and vain babblings, for they will increase unto more ungodliness. These types of things you just got to stay away from because they will consume you. And verse 17 says, And the word will eat as doth a canker, of whom is Hymenius and Philetus. Paul, John, Paul's just saying this, you need to watch out if you allow old conflicts to create bitterness in you, it will be a canker that's down inside of you that will eat you up until it destroys you. And so how do I deal with that? I got to put the old conflicts beside, put it out. If I need to make try to make things right, I need to try to reconcile things. If I need to say I forgive you, then I need to say I forgive you. I need to forgive uh, as Christ forgave and uh, and uh, enables us to know that they may not deserve to be forgiven, but wait a minute, that's how we're supposed to give, forgive as God for Christ's sake has forgiven you. You and I didn't deserve to be forgiven. And so don't allow an unforgiving, bitter heart to inflict in you wounds that's going to destroy you. And then you will hinder true worship of God is in, in reference to what is really needed in your life. Uh, you know, it's amazing how quickly Christians, when there's a conflict in our life, the first thing that goes in our life is reading the Bible and prayer. The next thing that goes in our life is getting out of church. And why is that? Because if you allow resentment and bitterness to become wounds that's destroying your life, it will hinder your ability to truly worship God. And when you're not worshiping God, you're not experiencing the presence and the anointing of the Spirit of God in your life. Matthew chapter 5 and verse 23 says, Therefore, if thou bring thy gift to the altar, and there rememberest that thy brother hath all against thee, leave there thy gift, before the altar and go thy way first be reconciled to thy brother and then come and offer thy gift I think it's very interesting that he doesn't say uh, just wait and make sure your brother comes to you and get things right no he said if listen if this breakdown in this relationship is hindering your worship with God then you take the initiative and try to get things right why? Because I don't want to look back at old conflict. There's all kinds of things that, and as a pastor, I'm telling you, there's all kinds of things that people have said. I've had church members come in my office and cuss me out. And what am I going to do? Live my life? Live with it? Oh, boy, I'll tell you what. I hope God's wrath falls on that person and allow resentment and bitterness to well up in my heart? Or am I going to give it over to God and I'm going to live in the grace of God and I'm going to be willing to forgive the person who did that to me and not treat them differently because of what they have done. Because the reality is when you live in reference to conflicts that are in your life, it will tie you up inside so strongly that you will not have the freedom and the liberty to worship God in heaven. And so don't look back at old conflicts that makes you bitter. Uh, you can't change them. You can try to offer reconciliation, forgiveness, but you can't dwell on them. Let it go. Just let it go. Why? Because it's hindering your ability to enjoy worship and service of God in the future. And here's the last one. Don't look back at old victories that may cause you to think you were right. Oh my, there's been, I've heard it over the years. Wow, I'll tell you one thing. Back in 22, uh, man, I'll tell you, God was moving back then. God used us in a great way. Why, well, I led one person to the Lord. And uh, I'll tell you one thing, I don't, I'm just really rejoicing in how good it was. God's not moving like He used to. Well, don't look back at your old victories that may cause you to think that you've arrived. 
And you still need to be growing in the Lord. You still need to be maturing. You still need to be involved in what God's doing. And Philippians chapter 3 and verse 13 uh, refuse personal uh, sanctification. Notice what he says. Brethren, I count not myself to apprehend it. But there's one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forth to those things which are before. Uh, what's he doing? He says he's refusing his personal sanctification. I count not myself to ap be apprehended. He's saying this, I haven't arrived. God's working in me. And God is blessing me. And there's desires I have for God to move in my life. But the reality is, oh, uh, I still have a long ways to go in this matter of sanctification. You and I have not arrived yet. We're not super, super of, uh, spiritual beings being sitting here tonight. Every one of us need to grow in the Lord knowing this. I can't say, well, you know, well, you know, I, I, I preach for quite a few years now. I, I really don't need to preach anymore. No, I still need to preach what God gives me and lays on my heart to preach. And realizing this, I cannot get consumed with the thought of pride that I know it all. I've got it all figured out. I'm finding this, the older I get, the longer I preach, the more I realize how ignorant I am. And I like to hear from other people. I like to talk to different people. I like to hear different preachers preach. I like to read different materials. I, I need to know more. I need to know, I need to know. I'm not going to say, well, I already got it all figured it out, figured out. The message I preached this morning, a lot of it is, is similar stuff, familiar stuff that we know that you've been saved a while. You know a lot of those principles. But I want you to know I put about 20 hours into that message to be able to put it together. I've been working on that over the last three weeks. <coughs> Just looking at what's going on in the world and everything. I'm not going to put a message like that together and say, well, I already know about the seven years of tribulation. I already got that all figured out. No, there's something else I need to know about it. I, I, I can't live my life and do ministry in light of the fact, man, I'll tell you what, I've been doing this a long time. I've got it all figured out. No, there's something else God wants to teach me. So I don't want to look back at old victories because it may cause me to think I've arrived and I won't continue to enjoy the sanctification of God and move closer and closer to the Lord. We need to re remain committed to personal maturation or maturity, but I had to rhyme with sanctification. <laughs> Notice he says here, uh, this one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind, and reaching forth unto those things which are before. He's saying this, I, I, can't, I can't base my life in the past in reference to my sanctification in the present. Because I need to acknowledge this, I still need to go farther. I still need to learn more. I still need to be more mature in my walk with God. And then remember our goal is personal emulation. In other words, we're to imitate Christ. In uh, Philippians 3, 14, he said, I press towards the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. And uh, it's not about us uh, conforming to a denominational role. It's not about us conforming to some movement. And let me say this, there's been a lot of movements in the years that I've been saved. And I found this, that... Uh, every one of them falls off the scene after a while. And many churches go chasing after those things, and the next thing you know, when they fall off the scene, then the church is left floundering, trying to figure out who they are and what they are. I remember years ago, I was talking to my brother and about some of these different uh, trends in Christianity <coughs> and churches, and I told him, I said, the sad thing is what has happened is the church has lost its identity because they're trying to identify with every kind of movement that's coming down the pike. And what happens when that movement, movement ends? You don't know who you are. You don't know who you identify with. 
And it, it is a powerful revelation to know this, that Jesus Christ is the chief cornerstone. Amen. Jesus Christ is the head of the church. Amen. Jesus Christ is the one that we are striving to model after. Amen. It is not some movement or some well-known preacher that's out in the circuit preaching at churches. It is Jesus Christ and Christ alone. Amen. So I don't look at old victories. Oh, there's been some movements that have been put together. And yes, it's created some excitement in churches. And yes, it created some attendance increase in churches. But wait a minute. When it fades off the scene, what is left? It's got to be Jesus Christ and Christ alone. Amen. So watch out. Don't look back. Jesus said, no man, having put his hand to the plow and looking back, is fit for the kingdom of God. So here it is, review. Don't look back at sins that have been forgiven. Don't look back at defeats that get you down. Don't look back and see the past better than it was. Don't look back at old conflicts that make you bitter. And don't look back at old victories that may cause you to think you've arrived. we got a long ways to go, folks. We're in this for the long haul. We're looking for Jesus to come. And I'm going to tell you, when Jesus comes, we're going into eternity. It's the long haul. Jesus Christ may come in the next few hours. He may not come for the next 200 years. But we're in it for the long haul. And so be careful. You need to leave the past. And you need to look to the future. Let's pray. Father, thank you so much for allowing us to be together this evening. Your grace is such a blessing, Lord, in our life to know uh, that the grace of God is sufficient for everything that we need. Uh, these experiences in life are real. We, we all struggle in, at different times in different ways with each of these thoughts. And so help us, Lord, to follow the uh, admonition of Christ, knowing that once we put our hand to the plow, we just hang on and we just keep going forward. We keep following Christ. We keep looking to the Lord. We don't look at things from the past. And God, I pray that you'd help us to see victories day by day as we walk with Jesus. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's stand. We're going to sing a song, Have Thine Own Way. While we're singing, if you need to pray or like to pray, why don't you come and kneel here in the altar and pray. If you're not sure you're saved, why don't you come? We'll show you how to be saved tonight. I'll be down front here. Tom will be leading the song. So let's uh, sing, Have Thine Own Way. <laughs> service we have this evening. Lord, I thank you for the thought that we need to look ahead for the great things you have in store for us and not look back, Lord. 
Um, I believe that the greatest days of this church, this of your blessing this earth, are far ahead of us, Lord. I pray that we would just continue to work towards that and press towards those goals. Dismiss us for your blessing. Help us to come back Wednesday to hear again from you and ask all these things in Jesus' name. Amen.